The Dodgers acquire another left-handed pitcher and also got three up, three down. When will Otani break out of his slump? Mookie Betts is historic start. And should the Dodgers go to a six-man rotation? All that more coming up next here on Dodgers Dugout Live. It's time for Dodger Baseball. That that's right play. Dodgers have won it all in 2020. Mookie Betts. I don't care how many times this team rips my heart out, I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Stay blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. Welcome to another episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do us a huge favor and subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel, the number one Dodgers YouTube channel in the game. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. And also, make sure you comment done down below so you're eligible for our next giveaway at 90,000 subscribers. Also, speaking of giveaways, I actually got a giveaway from one of our listeners, I appreciate this. A little quarter zip action. You know I love my quarter zips here. And I got a nice little letter here. What up, DMAC? It's Jelly Donut, a big fan of Dodgers Nation and longtime subscriber to the YouTube channel. I recently ordered a bunch of Dodger gear from MLB Shop to get ready for the season, and I ended up with an extra quarter zip pullover size large. He grew up in Long Beach. Mr. Kevin Cooper, really, really appreciate you rocking with us and all you guys out there for rocking with us as always. And what a night for your Los Angeles Dodgers. LA, they stay hot five runs a game this entire season. They improved to six and two after being the Giants five to four you had logan webb on the mound finished second the nl Cy young voting and the dodgers found a way to get it done with a bullpen game but let me know down below in the comment section by the way on all your takes throughout the show i got my super producer to my left mr antonio he's going to be looking for all your fire takes we're going to include them in the seventh inning stretch later in the show we're also looking for the comment of the show anytime we see one of these you're going to see this let's go dodgers action here Win. so definitely Perfect. be sure to comment down below but let's dive right into it. we're gonna do a little three up three down to start the show and for the up we got Mookie Betts' historic start. Mookie is living his Betts life. Mookie homered once again yesterday, his fifth home run of the season. He leads all of Major League Baseball with five dingers. He's hotter than the devil's armpit. He continued that last night. Like I said, he cranked his Major League leading fifth home run of the year. 3-1 changeup. 3-1 changeup from Logan Webb, and he was able to hit it out. It really sets the tone for the Dodgers early on. Sets the tone for the Dodgers. He's able to score a run, and then he scored two runs in the game. He also had another hit, and that home run was Mookie's 1,500th career hit. He goes two for five with a bomb, a stolen base, scored twice, and he helped the Dodgers win once again. Now, on the year, these statistics, these are more than video game numbers. He's hitting 500. His OPS is sitting at 1770. He has a 322 weighted runs created plus. We're talking about steroids era Barry Bonds numbers from Marcus Lynn Betts. He's on an absolutely historic heater. He has 1.4 F4, 1.4 F4 so far. The second highest behind him is Anthony Volpe, who has 0.7. Of course, Mookie did play some extra games due to the Korea series, but he's playing shortstop. He is more engaged. He is getting it done. And I think 
it's more about him being fueled by the fact that last couple of seasons haven't gone the way Mookie's wanted them to. Yes, he's had a lot of success in the regular season, but last two postseasons combined, he went two for 14, the 2022 NLDS where the Dodgers were upset by the Padres. And then last season, he had an 0 for, he goes 0 for 11 in the 2023 NLDS. So this is a man who, in my opinion, I've spoken to Mookie Betts. And when you ask about his last season where he finished with more war than the MVP winner, Ronald Acuna Jr., he doesn't care about that. He cares about the fact that he did not finish strong, that he struggled in the postseason. He knows how important he is to this team. He is the straw that stirs the Dodgers drink. Mookie realizes that fully. He knows when he crosses home plate, the odds of this team winning that game are extremely high compared to when he does it. And I think he's fueled by that 225, that two for 25 in the last two postseason series. I also think he's fueled by the fact that the Dodgers signed Shohei Otani and that everyone thought that Shohei Otani was going to solve all the Dodgers problems and that Shohei Otani is the best player on the planet. Well, right now, the best player on the planet is Marcus Lynn Betts. And what I say on this show, the day after Mookie took over the shortstop position, I said, if Mookie plays anywhere near average level defense at shortstop he is going to run away with the national league mvp we saw a couple years ago with cody bellinger he won the mvp early on the season mookie Betts could do the same you know you're having a historic start when you're talking mvp and we are in march so that is the kind of start that mookie Betts is on and i think look the pessimist in me though the pessimist in me every time he has one of his home runs i think to myself Man, Mookie, can we save a couple of those bombs for October? Can you save some of that? And I think that preserving Mookie is really important, but I think physically he's in fantastic shape. I think mechanically he's as synced up as he's been. He's just so locked in at the plate. His timing has been impeccable. And another thing, too, you remember last season, Mookie got off to a really slow start. Mookie was really struggling to start the year in 2023, and what do we see when he started to go off? I mean, he had 39 home runs. A lot of those home runs, though, a lot of those home runs, he was kind of waiting for it. He was sprinting, and he was trying to think maybe they're going to be off the wall as doubles. Not these. These are bleacher reachers. These are six, seven, eight rows deep in the pavilion because he's absolutely crushing these bombs. Last season, though, last season, Mookie Betts, he started out, he had 235 with four home runs, had 11 RBI, and 781 OPS in his first 27 games. So last season, first 27 games, Mookie hit, love you back, Jimmy, love you too, my man. Um, last uh, last year, Mookie, first 27 games, hit just 235, 11 RBI, 781 OPS. This season, you look at the heater he's on, an OPS over 1,700, 322, weighted runs created plus. So I'm going to ask you this right now. Is Mookie peaking too early? Do you think he's going to win the NL MVP? Let me know down below in the comment section. I got some super chats from my man, Mr. Antonio, to my left, super producer. Betts triple crown. Interesting. I mean, you look at the batting average. Obviously, it's gaudy. It's at 500. If you look at the home runs, it is uh, obviously he's off to a really, really good start. I think that having his own teammate in... Uh, and Otani is going to catch up, and I think he's going to hit a ton of uh, of home runs pretty soon. But, yeah, it hasn't happened since Miguel Cabrera. I think it's possible. I mean, I definitely think it is possible. I mean, I think the number that you look at, I mean, it hasn't happened since 2000, 2012. When Miguel Cabrera hit 330, he had 44 home runs and 139 RBIs. By the way, if you look at the war numbers, even though Miggy won the Triple Crown, it still should have been Mike Trout's award. If you look at the war numbers, Mike Trout should have been the MVP that season. I think the RBIs is going to be where it could be difficult for Mookie, but when it comes to home runs, he had 39 last season. I mean, not seeing guys really go north of 50, save for the Aaron Judges of the world. Batting average, I think it's going to be high because he has so much protection around him. So I wouldn't put it past him, but I do think he is going to win the MVP. That was my preseason pick, and I'm sticking with him. We got no home run derby for Mookie. That's from Craig Osterberg. It's a fire team fire there. Team. This is from Craig Osterberg. Carnivorous through activity. Back to the top of the rotation tonight. Sweep the Giants. Yeah, you got Tyler Glass now on the hill for the Dodgers. He was excellent in his last start. Was really good in his first start, and he really has assumed the 
similar role as the Dodgers ace. Dodgers really have multiple aces, but still, I think when you look at the five days rest, how fresh that they're keeping these starting pitchers, you got to expect almost at this point, six, maybe even seven innings, 90 to 100 pitches. We got going tonight, Axel X Jimenez. Hey, there's nothing better than Dodgers Stadium. So you're going to have a great time. Bleed blue, Mo, not much better than Dodgers beating the Giants. Lawrence Jarris, good morning, DMAC, MVP Mookie. He's looking focused on winning the World Series, World Series MVPs too. Yeah, I think one thing that has been made very clear to me about Mookie Betts is no one wants this more than Mookie, okay? Everyone says the bowling ball, the bowling this and that. He's the MVB, most valuable bowler. No, this is someone who holds himself to such a high standard. Look, the ball, the baseball looks like it's the same size as a bowling ball right now to Mookie Betts, but that's about it. He is not just focused on being a great player. He said a couple of weeks ago before the season that he wanted to go down as a legend, want to go down as a Hall of Famer. He said in his press conference after he signed the $365 million contract that he wanted to win multiple rings. He knows what's at stake as far as his legacy goes. And he's a great player. And as Ken Griffey Jr. told me, the Dodgers are extremely lucky to have him. We got LAD still Mookie's team. Yeah, that's that's a great take right there. I think that's something that you can take away from the first couple of weeks is this is still Mookie's team. They signed Shohei Otani, but like I said, Mookie is the stir that straw that's the straw that stirs the Dodgers drink. This is from Tyo. Mookie is hot right now. You think affecting Otani a little bit might be putting pressure on him. I don't think that we're going to talk about Otani here in a second. Michael Hoffer way too early to predict anything games into the season. Getting this excited about Mookie's start would be the equivalent of getting overly concerned about Shohei's. I mean, that's probably a little true, but I also think that, look, it's not like this is a fluke. Mookie was a fantastic player last season. He just didn't have the best start and the best finish. So maybe this season he flips the script and he has a great start and a great finish and maybe struggles a little bit in the middle. So I definitely think it's worth discussing. But next up, we're going to go down. So the first down for the three up, three down is umpire Phil Fuzzy. Umpire Phil Cuzzy was an absolute disaster yesterday. I do not know if he had early dinner reservations at the Palm, but my man had just so many bad calls throughout the night. The one that really stood out to me was fourth inning, two outs, 2-2 two -two count, and he rings up Gavin Lux on a fastball that is well off the inside part of the plate. And you just can't have that. You can't have that in major league baseball. And I think when it comes to Phil Cuzzy, just look at where he stands because he's setting up right behind the catcher. And by doing that, you can't see the corners of the strike zone. And he's basically being blocked by the catcher and he's not able to make the right call. So he's someone that needs to be, he needs to change his alignment behind the catcher but just look at Gavin Lux here I mean this is I mean goodness gracious I mean does the plate have wheels on it because that was just a horrendous call and what I've heard around the league is that we could see the ABS automated automated balls and strikes we could see that by as early as the 2025 season and you're not talking about robo ums through the entire game but what they're doing right now at the minor league level and they're having great success with it is the three challenge rule. Now, I love Dave Roberts would use his challenge there. It's earlier in the game. You don't have runners on base, but having three challenges, I think it's going to be engaging for fans. And I think that it's going to make umpires better. It's going to take the pressure off of umpires. I have B Guzman who says the ump needs a seeing eye dog. And there was not just that. I mean, how about Ryan Yarbrough to Yaz, that strike that was called a ball and how about Evan Phillips later in the game was getting called for balls that were strikes I mean it was just not a good game for Kip Phil Cuzzy the umpire report guard had it at 1.46 runs for San Francisco so yeah I mean I need to see the automated balls and strikes the ABS system implemented in Major League Baseball it's long overdue if this was the NFL it would have been done five six seven eight years ago don't tell me that this is bad for the game because it takes some theater out of it because 
because you want to see umpires arguing with managers. You don't see that anymore, right? You don't see the Tommy Lasorda's kicking dirt on the umpires in the Sparky Andersons. Those days are gone. If anything, it's going to add an extra layer because anytime that this challenge is going to be executed by the managers, you're going to dial in and you're going to want to wait for that announcement. And I think that you need this as soon as possible. A couple more comments here. The umps are hating on us. That's from RC22. Deep fried beans over on YouTube. The only Manfred rule I hate is the extra innings runner. That is garbage clown baseball. You don't like the Manfred man. You don't like the ghost of zombie runner. I mean, I think that if they had it in the postseason, I'd be infuriated. But the regular season... I think it, I don't mind it as much. I don't hate it. I think you want to preserve pitchers. You don't want to have four hour games and it's a little bit of a way to end the game earlier. And you see that in most sports, right? In basketball, the overtime is five minutes in football. It's a situation where you can exchange field goals and you got the way to make that game shorter too so in most sports overtime is going to have a little bit of a tweak it's not going to be the same rules as the regulation so i'm not overly upset about that one pitch clock bad for pitchers that's from one eye dragon if you look at the data for the pitch clock and the pitchers one thing that they learned later on the season is that the pitchers were actually finding out a way to basically maximize the time in between every single pitch. Whereas to start the year, they were trying to execute that pitch as quickly as possible to avoid a pitch clock violation. But then they got the timing down, the rhythm down, and then they took it down to the final seconds. And what that allowed them to do was get them to throw max effort. That's what's important to these pitchers. It's can you get to a max effort pitch? That's why we're in the velocity revolution. And I still think we need to see years of this to determine if it's a situation where it's leading to increased injuries. There's people out there that believe that. I think it's more that pitchers are throwing harder than they ever have. And I think it's more a byproduct of that. If you take away the pitch clock, they're still going to be doing that, right? But forget it. It's not in the playoffs. That's good at least. Exactly, right? We got uh, Steven Lopez over here. Did you hear Kershaw say they're not able to see balls in the strikes on the dugout? What's up with that? I'm not sure what's up with that. I did catch that. And they don't have the automated little box so they can see the strike zone. And I really am curious to see why Major League Baseball didn't have that. Maybe they don't want the dugout kind of murmuring and getting upset about calls. But that's a strange one to me. I, I almost think that is some type of error. So I'd be curious to see if that was intentional or not. And if it was, why weren't the players notified about it? Okay, so next one for my three up, three down. We got... Bottom of the order finally came alive. It was like the Undertaker meme where the Undertaker wakes up out of the coffin. That was the bottom of the lineup yesterday. The bottom of the order, they have been struggling mightily through the Dodgers' first seven games of the season, but that changed last night. Gavin Lux, he got his first extra base hit of the season. He cranked an RBI double in the bottom of the fourth inning to give the Dodgers a 3-2 lead. And it was a really great at-bat for him, a really great at-bat for Gavin Lux stayed back and was able to, as Doc said after the game, find some grass in the outfield and find an extra base hit. And hopefully that kind of gets him going from that standpoint. And then Kike Hernandez, he follows that up with a two run single to pad that lead to three. So Kike was one of the stars last night, offensively producing runs from the bottom of the order and also defensively. I mean, he absolutely robbed Chapman of a hit on that dive. Also the strength ski catch on the warning track just impacting the game in left field this is someone who has center field level range in left field so you got a lot of coverage out there so i thought kike hernandez was outstanding and that really was the big hit of the game i mean you got the bottom of the lineup he's up there against logan webb he's able to not try to do too much right and sometimes kike's swing can get a little long not in that at bat. He tries to put the ball in play. Good things happen. The Dodgers get a couple of runs. And then you also had James Altman. So James Altman, he's had some bad luck of late. Yesterday, two of the outs that he recorded were balls that had a 
expected batting average of almost 700. He was hitting the ball hard all night, but Outman, Lux, and Hernandez, they went three for 10, had three RBI. Lux goes one for two with the RBI double, also drew two walks, and then Kike with a key base hit and the diving catch and another stellar play on the Yastrzemski. You saw Ryan Yarbrough kind of tapping his glove, giving him all the credit. So I love the energy that Kike is bringing. I love the role that he's playing. He also looks healthy. He looks athletic. He's got his speed back. He looks like a different guy following that surgery. So that's definitely an up. Now the down, got to go back to the down. We got Otani, no home run again, no hits for Shohei. So Shohei Otani, we're still waiting for the Shohei Otani eruption. And so far on the year, Otani, he's hitting 242 has a 72 weighted runs created plus. So a little context there. He's hitting 242. Mookie's hitting 500. He has a 72 weighted runs created plus. Mookie has a 322 weighted runs created plus. Mookie has five home runs. Otani has zero. And he told reporters a couple days ago when he was asked about how he's feeling, Otani said, I feel like I'm seeing the ball well, but I feel like there's a little bit something off with my timing and being able to kind of feel the distance between the ball and myself. So I think he hit it right on the nail. I think that Otani really kind of told you what's going on. It's a timing issue. You're still seeing the bat speed look great. It's getting through the zone very fast. And he's already set a record with how hard he's hitting the ball. So anytime he's making contact, it's a rocket shot. It's just getting in that groove. I think for Shohei Otani, it's a little bit of a slump buster, right? He's in a slump buster situation where he needs that one home run. I don't care how he gets it out. I don't care if it's a lucky swing. I don't care if he just lifts it out over the left field wall by a couple inches. Otani's been streaky throughout his career. I'm not so sure how closely you followed Otani, but there have been moments where he has been streaky, where he has gone through stretches where he's gotten cold only to absolutely explode. And he's not up there to be Juan Soto, right? He's not up there to draw walks and just be an on-base machine. He's up there to hit home runs, to get extra base hits, and that's what he does. So he's going to go up there. He's going to be hacking. You're going to see those big daddy hacks where the helmet's going off and you see that nice Otani hair and he's fixing it and he's trying to get that bomb. And I also think, yes, is he pressing maybe a little bit, which is totally understandable. He just signed a $700 million contract. He's dealing with the investigation, which I'm sure is impacting him a little bit. Look, just because Shohei Otani is superhuman as a baseball player doesn't mean he's not human, right? He is still human. And I think you're seeing the effects of that. But once you see one go over the wall, He's going to go off. I fully believe that. And I'm not worried about Shohei Otani whatsoever. I think that early on this season, he definitely has gone off to a slow start. But what I just tell you about Mookie Betts, he got off to a slow start last season and he finished second in the NL MVP. And he also finished with more war than Ronald Acuna Jr. So, Let's pump the brakes and slow down on Shohei. I see people saying, oh, it's Shover. It's Shover, that kind of stuff. R-E-L-A-X. Relax. Otani is going to be just fine. John says Otani going yard tonight. Noah Ortega says Otani made 15 home runs <coughs> in July. <sighs> DMAC, we're waiting on the hats to drop. What's up? We're going to work on those hats. And when we come back, we got more up, more down. And should the Dodgers go to a six-man rotation? That's coming up next here on Dodgers Dugout Live. What up, Dodgers Nation? D-Mag here. I'm here to remind you that if you have not yet, be sure to subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel for all latest Dodgers news, rumors, hype videos, interviews, breakdowns, live streams, and more all year long. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. And if you really want to help the channel out, smash that like button. Also, you will not be eligible for any of our giveaways unless you are subscribed to the channel. So all you need to do to be eligible for all of our giveaways is just make sure that you are subscribed. We just gave away a brand new authentic Mookie Betts jersey valued at over $350. And we got tons of giveaways coming this offseason. So be sure to be subscribed so you are eligible to win. And as always, think blue, bleed blue, and please subscribe. And welcome back to Dodgers Dugout Live. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Got DMAC, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Just went down the wrong pipe there. 
that drink must be really strong. That's from BC. <laughs> Deep fried beans. Yo, how'd you get D Mac from Dodgers Nation to do your ad? <laughs> hey, man, we paid him a lot of money. Tim T, D Mac drinking too much out of the shoe this offseason. We got a super chat. They got a little super chat love right here. This is from Ivan. Yo, Webb struggled and couldn't perfect. get it done with the best strike zone and up helping him out. Absolutely. I mean, that was a gold opportunity for that Giants team to get a win against the Dodgers, and they couldn't do it. That Korean flu is for real i'm i'm good to go dodger baseball is back that's from johnny okay so next one for my up <clears throat> is the bullpen game worked the bullpen game worked and they beat logan webb and ryan yarbrough he takes over for ryan brazier brazier had a scoreless first inning and brazier first couple innings he went 40 pitches and he ended up settling down. He went just 16 pitches, had two f perfect innings, and he had those great plays by Kike Hernandez that really helped him end the fifth inning there. He did go back out there in the sixth. He allowed that solo home run there to Jorge Soler. Another run scored after Tyro Estrada's fielder's choice. Then Alex Vesia came in, and Vesia looked really good. He went just seven pitches. And he held that Dodgers lead to one. And then Michael Grove, he came in, was really good in the seventh inning, struck out two. And then he goes out there in the eighth inning and he kind of struggled a little bit. He put the tying run in scoring position. Evan Phillips, he comes in there and he converts the four out save. And he does just that on just 17 pitches. So give credit to Dave Roberts. So the, it was a really great decision to go out there <coughs> and bring in Evan Phillips. So, the Dodgers get the dub on that one. And there you have it. Three up, three down. And I think this Dodgers team, they're in a really good spot right now. You got Tyler Glass now tonight on the mound. You got to sweep that Giants team. But the interesting thing, oh, I got my last down. My last down is this one, actually. I got one more down. My last down is the Diamondbacks team store is selling a picture of Kershaw kind of slumping over in the NLDS. And my response to that is, did you not learn from the Padres last season that Clayton Kershaw is real? Do you also sell a picture of the Dodgers celebrating in the pool? That, to me, would be a better picture. Okay, so enjoy that. Enjoy that win over the Dodgers. Enjoy your World Series run. But at the end of the day, you didn't win a World Series. So I just don't like this. The disrespect for the legends like Clayton Kershaw, last year was the Padres, this year it is the Arizona Diamondbacks. I thought that's Bush League. Like I said, I'd much rather see a picture of Kirsch and his time against the Diamondbacks, and I'd rather see a picture of the Dodgers celebrating in that D-backs pool versus Kirsch slumping over when he was a shell of himself, and he went out there and tried to help this team despite probably not even being at 60 70%, showed a lot of heart. So, I'm going to remember that Diamondbacks when bad things happen this season, the Dodgers run away with this division and look what happened to the Padres. The Padres beat the Dodgers in the postseason, then went on to troll Clayton Kershaw with the crying meme. They didn't make the postseason. Fast forward a year later, the Diamondbacks, they beat the Dodgers and then they troll him. They troll Kirsch and then we'll see what happens this year. So, not a smart move if I'm the Diamondback. So next up, we got some news to get into. The Dodgers, they acquire left-handed pitcher Nick Martinez from the Yankees for cash considerations. Bruce Dar Gratterall was moved to that 60-day IL. So let's dive into this one. So yesterday, we talked about it, how Matt Gage was released by the Dodgers. They freed up that roster spot for outfielder Taylor Tremel, and I think today you'll see most likely Dave Roberts. I'm guessing if I had to, if I had to guess, you have to believe that Jason Hayward, they're going to be very cautious about this. And that Jason Hayward will have an IL stint. It'll probably be of the 15 day variety, something like that. And that Taylor Tremel probably will get an opportunity. He's an outfielder. He's left-handed. You can still platoon him with Chris Taylor. You don't have to burn uh, Andy Pajes' option. You still get Pajes to go out there and get those at-bats he needs at the minor league level. So that's probably what's going to happen. And Nick Martinez is interesting. I mean, a 266 ERA, a 387 expected ERA in 32 games for the Yankees in 2023, 
28 punch outs to nine walks and 40 innings of work. If you look at the splits, they're extremely interesting because as a lefty, lefties fared better against him than righties. Lefties hit 308 against him and righties hit 221 against him. So he was better against righties than he was against lefties. If you look at his career, he's been better to go against lefties. A 701 against Southpaws compared to 728 against righties. He's pitched in parts of four seasons with the Tigers, the Yankees, the Padres. He's a Cal State Fullerton alum. He's 34. He was born and raised in Anaheim, California. And one of the reasons why they went with Martinez is he does have one option year remaining. Ramirez. What I said? It's his name. Oh, sorry. Austin Ramirez. I don't know why I keep saying that. <laughs> uh, one of the things about Ramirez is he has one more option year remaining. And that's one of the reasons why they went off of Nabil Krizmat. Is Krizmat had no option years. He didn't have that flexibility. And that's what the Dodgers are really going to try to do. They're probably going to play the DFA game a little bit throughout this season to try to continue to keep these starting pitchers, and these relievers as fresh as possible. And Ramirez, with the one option year, he joins Alex Vesia as the only lefties that you can use in short burst situations. So we'll see if Ramirez can be something. Like I said, a 266 ERA, a 387 expected ERA, that's solid. That's definitely solid. And I think if you're this Dodgers team that doesn't have a lot of lefties in their bullpen, Ramirez, if he can flash, he'd show something. It'll be interesting with that option to see what they can do. Because you have Alex Vesia, who has struggled at times, looked really good last night, has proven to go on certain stretches where he looks really, really good and has really looked dominant after the all-star break last season. So it's, do you kind of stay patient with Alex Vesia to start this season? Or does Vesia figure things out earlier than later this year? Because you have Alex Vesia, you now have Nick Ramirez, and then with Ramirez, you have a guy, one option you're remaining, and then a Ryan Yarbrough. And Ryan Yarbrough is more of your bulk, multi-inning reliever like we saw last night. So, yeah, to make room on that 40-man roster for Ramirez, the Dodgers, they transfer Bruce Dark Gratterall to the 60-day IL Gratterall and Blake Trinan a couple days ago, Dave said that they were both quote a ways away from returning. And now it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. They won't be available to return until at the earliest May 18th. So you got Gratterall, you got Emmett Sheehan, some of these Dodgers pitchers that you expected to have a big role for this team on the shelf to start the season. Now, next thing I want to talk about before we head out of here pretty soon is the six man rotation. I think yesterday it really just kind of hit me like it's hit me for the last couple of, of months, really that the six man rotation is inevitable. And you look at what this team is trying to accomplish with keeping guys fresh in October and the kind of pitchers they have in this rotation that they're all going to benefit from that <laughs> extra day of rest, that fifth day of rest. And I think that this team can get by with the six starters and the seven relievers, especially when Ryan Yarbrough can go multiple innings. Only thing is that these guys, when they get those opportunities, they have to go out there and they have to give you six, possibly seven and close to a hundred innings. But you see this first turn through the rotation. Everyone pitched relatively well. Bobby Miller, he was dominant. 11 strikeouts. Tyler Glass now, he was dominant. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he flashed that all-world talent, that nasty stuff. Gavin Stone, he was great in his first start. Paxton did have some traffic, but was able to get out of it. You saw that fastball with the carry on it. It's going to be working up in the zone. I think he's going to have a really nice year for the Dodgers as long as he stays healthy. So none of these guys that have gone so far have given this team any reason to throw them out of the rotation. So when Walker Buehler returns after three more minor league starts, towards the end of April, there's no reason why you can't have this six-man rotation. You have the built-in extra days off because they played in Korea, so you can get some extra days off for your bullpen pieces, and it just makes too much sense, especially when you look ahead to next season when Otani is going to be back out there on the mound. He's someone that's used to pitching once a week. They could have Roki Sasaki next season used to pitching once a week. So I think that this team is built to have a six-man rotation. They have been actually doing this for stretches for, since 2000, 
15. I mean, dating back to 2015. It's not like it's something new. It just become more of a buzzword just because people want to act like it's this shocking development. No, they've actually kind of flirted with this and done it through stretches throughout the last, you know, seven, eight, nine seasons. Not completely new. I think it's for them, though, just to go out there and kind of commit to it. Like I said, the most important thing, though, anytime you have a six man rotation is when the pitchers do get their opportunities and you give them the ball, you say to them, look, you got that extra day of rest. <laughs> we need a hundred innings. We need, we need a hundred pitches out of you six or seven innings, right? You can't have guys going out there and they do have kind of rough starts. You kind of have to go out there and absorb it, right? You're not going to get the quick pull. If you have to give up four or five runs in your start, you just going to have to kind of live with it and kind of eat it a little bit. If you're one of these Dodgers starters. So that's kind of one of my big takeaways is this team you look at where we're at a bullpen game on April 2nd. No. Okay. That's not going to be okay. That's not going to play for an entire season, right? Yes. Rock you bro. He definitely gave you some bulk there Grove. They were hoping would go longer, but really the recipe for this team is if you have six guys that are fresh and effective, you can get it done with those seven relievers. So I love the idea of a six man rotation. Walker Buehler is healthy, but now we're going to go to the seventh inning stretch where you guys can drop any questions that you want. And we will answer them here. We got Richard Flores. I don't understand why people are worried about Otani. I think he looks great. Sincerely Austin Barnes. That's a fire take. That's a fire. That's actually a, finish a little bit of a roast there. What's up DMAC? What up Brian? April also is a slow start for Otani. Yeah, he's got off to some slow starts. I think for him, it's how well does he see the ball at Dodger Stadium, right? I mean, he's actually hit well at Dodger Stadium throughout his career, but it is a new home, and it's different when it's your home ballpark. So let's not forget that's a factor as well. Alex Cheeseman, more rest is perfect for the way to a rotation set up right now. Glass now has to prove he can stay healthy. Yoshi's first year, Bobby's second year of the rotation. Everyone will benefit. 100%. I mean, there were five guys that pitched 200 innings last season, right? And as you pointed out, there are so many questions up and down this rotation as far as glass now. His max innings in a season is 120. Starts 21. Bobby Miller, he looks great. Last year he pitched around 125 innings. Michael Grove, if he gets an opportunity to be a one-inning reliever, I think that can help them because they can spread them out a little more, right? And he can kind of supplement in there. And then Gavin Stone, he's still trying to prove it at this level. And you look at all the other relievers here and the other starters. I mean, you know, Momoto, Yoshinobu Yamoto trying to make his way here in the show. You got Paxton dealt with some injury issues. So, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. But uh, Michael Stone says, once they incorporate Walker Bueller, what will the Dodgers do when Clayton Kershaw comes back? Yeah, I mean, look. I would love to sit here and say that all these guys are going to stay healthy for the entire season, but that's a little unrealistic. And we know that at some point, one or two of these guys are going to get banged up. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that this is the year where the injury bug doesn't sink its teeth into the Dodgers starting rotation, but we've seen this movie before. We know how it ends and we know that there's going to be some bumps in the road and that by that time of year towards the middle to the end of the summer Clayton Kershaw comes and fills in the cracks if everyone stays healthy we know that if they feel good about Kirsch back on the mound that's that that's when they feel like okay we're gonna give him an opportunity because they're gonna probably like his velocity gonna probably like the feel for that slider and they, they know that when Kirsch is healthy that he can go out there and still be effective even with a little bit of diminished velocity. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. I think that it's all going to work itself out. I think the only question is, do these guys stay healthy enough towards the trade deadline to where you say, okay, these are one chance to bolster this rotation externally. Do they go that route knowing what happened in the NLDS last season where you had a compromised Kirsch in game one where you had Bobby Miller was a rookie, didn't have his best start in game two, and you had Lance Lynn gave like 15,000 home runs in game three. So that kind of makes you wonder about that. But uh, next one we got Doug. Let's see here.
special experience. And you guys know being there, 16,000, under 17,000 fans there. It was a really intimate experience to watch baseball. And just the fans of Korea, they embrace this Dodgers team. They view this Dodgers team as rock stars, and it was fantastic. But Doug Slayton said, DMAC, what's the timeline for Jong? Uh, I think probably a couple years. I mean, I was talking to Daniel Kim about him. Hyun Suk Jung, of course, the Dodgers pitcher they signed last season, who had been the top pick in Korea. He ends up signing with the Dodgers, and they gave him an international signing bonus, uh, just under a million dollars. But he would have been the number one pick in the KBO draft. So you should see him in a couple years. I mean, the velocity is going up. The slider has been something that they've been developing with him. So you're probably looking at a couple of years. I mean, he... And he could make his debut in 2025. So he could make his debut in 2025 with the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. So you're looking at a couple years down the line, right? So a couple years down the line. And uh, if he takes off, we've well, seen starting pitchers really have meteoric rises, especially through the Dodgers ranks. But he's got to start at some point. And I think 2025, you'll probably see him... Um, Probably you'll be going to be your first look within this organization. Jorge Luis Gomez, DMAC, who is your Cy Young prediction? You know what? I'm not one to change my predictions. I mean, I think Tyler Glass now has a really good shot if he stays healthy. I think he's shown dominant stuff, and I think that he's going to really have his peak years with his Dodgers organization. But look, I made a pick a couple months ago. I got to stick with my pick. Okay. I got to say Yoshinobu Yamamoto. And yeah, after that first start, I was uh, feeling a little bit like Homer Simpson backing into the hedge right there. But after the second start, I saw that potential. And that's when you really start to feel better about saying that. So I guess I'll stick with Yoshinobu Yamamoto, but so many talented pitchers in the national league. And I think it'd be cool to see Tyler glass now get a shot at it too. I mean, Tyler glass now is someone that is going to have the wins as far as the team success. And it's just a matter of him staying healthy, but he's someone who I think could absolutely Win it for the Dodgers. I mean, Bobby Miller could win the Cy Young. I mean, 11 strikeouts. I mean, Bobby Miller could win the Cy Young. I mean, they have so many guys here that could clean up when the awards come around, but a lot of talent. I mean, you got Zach Wheeler with the Phillies. You have Spencer Strider on the Braves. Logan Webb wasn't as impressed with Logan Webb. Zach Gallen, Max Freed, Freddie Peralta, the Brewers, Blake Snell with the Giants could have a really big year. I think Blake Snell is going to want to win back-to-back -back Cy Young so we can get another payday. Justin Steele's already been injured, but how, give me Yoshinobu Yamamoto. You know what? I'm going to just plant my flag there. I'm going to stick with Yamamania. And after what I saw my last start, like I said, no pitcher in the National League, I don't think, is going to embarrass hitters as much as Yamamoto is this season. Martin Rodriguez, trade prediction. Do I kind of keep playing this? Let's see. Oh, um, okay. Trade prediction at the deadline. Look, I think it depends on who stays healthy. If they don't go out there and pursue a starting pitcher, I think you might look to bolster the bullpen i think a you look at the marlins the way they've started the season the struggles they've had i think tanner scott makes all the sense in the world a dominant left-handed reliever by the way you see josh haters getting absolutely smoked with the astros so far but still extremely early in the season but look my trade prediction also is if you want a starting pitcher and this team decides to be sellers Shane Bieber is a name that I'm keeping my eyes on. Shane Bieber looked really good, had 10 punchies in his first start. He's really going to be one of the only brand name starting pitchers that could possibly be available if the Guardians decide they want to be sellers. So, look, we've seen this team for as much starting pitching as they add in the offseason. You can never have enough, and it just depends on who remains healthy. But Shane Bieber is a name I'm looking at. Tanner Scott is a name I'm looking at. And as far as the offense goes, it makes you wonder if things work out with Jason Hayward, if they do bring up Andy Pajes later in the year, or you do try to add another outfielder like a Tommy fan from last season. I think that that's probably a route they could go. And then look, I got to say it and I've said it for years now. I've heard this parroted everywhere, but Willie Adamas is still out there. And if this team wants to sure up that shortstop position and not put the brunt of the load on Mookie Best to play that position, 
Willie Adamas still makes a lot of the sense. So give me Shane Bieber, Willie Adamas, and Tanner Scott. Those are my three early favorites for trade deadline targets. And who knows, if things get crazy with St. Louis, Nolan Arenado is always a name that they've been linked to. But uh, some more here, and then we'll let you guys enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Hey, DMAC, it's the season of the Kershaw Shank Redemption. There's my comment of the show. Of course, a long time viewer of the show we were talking about that one for a while the kershaw shank redemption you win that's from mitchell hopkins oh, that's this is mitchell hopkins dmag i gave a kid a dollar the other day tell his dad go dodgers his dad was <laughs> was it was wearing dodge was wearing giants gear head to toe that's hilarious i love that um may want to make it a little wider so you can read the whole thing um philip jones do we think outman is on the bench tonight to give him an extra day of rest to rest before the road trip. I think that, look, they've been going pretty hard with James Altman. I wouldn't be totally shocked, but I think that he's so close to kind of breaking through with all the hard contact that he's had in the last couple games that I kind of want to see him out there because I think he really needs that game where he either hits a home run, has a key double, because he has been really searching for it for the start of the season. But Steven Lopez, Mookie said that everyone that plays the Dodgers will be playing their World Series and he's backing those words. Yeah, absolutely. Mookie stood on business, man. Mookie went out there and he said that he told me that they need to embrace that, right? They need to embrace the villain role. And that, like you said, every game is going to be the World Series for the opposing team. So for him to go out there and have this level of success this early, it shows you the kind of player that Mookie Betts is. He's top two, not two in Major League Baseball right now. He's the top guy on this team that's committed over a billion dollars this offseason so yeah i think that let's be honest i think we've taken mookie for granted i truly believe that as good and honestly i'm almost guilty of this too i think we've taken mookie for granted because he's just been so good so consistent in his time in dodger blue that we kind of focus on the end of the season struggles the last couple years let's not forget though 2020 no Mookie, no World Series. But a uh, couple more here, guys. We got De uh, Noah Barnes has a higher batting average than Otani, so let's extend Barnes. Hey, Miguel Rojas has one more home run than Shohei Otani, right? Uh, Victor Banos, uh, the lights are too bright at Dodger Stadium. Street Fighter, better than Mortal Kombat. I agree with you 100%. Uh, Dave is really trying hard to stay away. Why is there double audio? We'll fix that. Uh, Danny Cortez, uh, fire take D-Max, say opportunity like a Canadian man. Who's replacing Barnes in 2025? I mean, they have catchers in the system, right? I mean, I think you probably go out there and find a way to get a veteran catcher, most likely, but you still have guys. I mean, Cartaya, Ronzo, still ways away, but yeah, Dalton Rushing still ways away, but I think you probably see him go out there and, and get a veteran, but Hunter Fiducia, by the way, uh, but yeah, we'll fix that echoing, but that is going to do it for this episode of Dodgers Dugout Live. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. If you haven't yet, do us a huge favor and subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. We got last one here, Dan Sports SoCal. If we do go to a six-man rotation, I think we should... Uh, that one, it disappeared, but that's going to do it for this episode. My name is Doug McCain, and remember, nothing brings us together quite like Dodger baseball, and until next time, think blue, 